Hi, thanks for joining me. Today I'm going to be proving Fermat's Little Theorem. Now, I'm not going to be doing it in the standard way using number theory. I'm going to be using graph theory to prove it. So two completely different areas of maths, number theory and graph theory, combining them together, which is quite cool, I think. Anyway, let me state Fermat's Little Theorem and then I'll get on to the proof. Okay, so there are actually a couple of different formulations of Fermat's Little Theorem, but this is the one I'm going to be using today. Let A be some natural number, so some positive integer, and P is a prime number. Then, P divides A to the P minus A. So in other words, A to the P minus A is a multiple of P. Okay, so now let's get on to proving it using graph theory. <laughs> Okay, so to prove this using graph theory, what I'm going to firstly do is define this set S here as follows. So it's going to be the set of sequences of length P, uh, so I've called the elements here alpha 1, alpha 2, all the way up to alpha P, with the property that each of the alpha, each of the alpha i, so each of the elements in this uh, sequence of length P, is in the set 1, 2, 3, all the way up to A, and it also has the property that there exists i and j such that alpha i does not equal to alpha, alpha j. So in other words, this sequence here is not a constant sequence. Okay, so we can also define this set uh, to be this thing here, the set of alpha 1 all the way up to alpha p, for which uh, each of the alpha i's are in the set, 1 through a, but then we're not including the sequence 1, 1, or 2, 2, all the way up to... Uh, a, A. So these are all the constant sequences. So, in other words, S is the set of sequences of length P, in which all the elements are from the set 1, 2, 3, all the way up to A, uh, but none of these sequences in the set S are the constant sequences, so not all 1s or not all 2s, and so on. Okay, well how many elements are there in S? Okay, well let's look at this definition of S. So the number of elements in S is going to be the number of elements in this set here, minus the number of elements in this set here. Well, the number of elements in this set here, well, we've got A choices for the first element, A choices for the second element, A choices for the third element, and so on. So the number of elements in this set here is A, uh, A to the P, sorry. Okay, and the number of elements in this set here is going to be A, because we've got one sequence, two sequence, all the way up to A sequences. Okay, so A to the P minus A. So the cardinality of S is A to the P minus A. And now you can see this is looking sort of Fermat's little theorem E, uh, because we've got the A to the P minus A in. Now let's talk a bit more about graph theory in order to prove Fermat's little theorem. Okay, so now what I want to do is construct a graph which represents S in some way. Okay, so I'm going to call this graph G, and we're going to have each of the vertices in G represents a distinct sequence in S. So in other words, a distinct element in S. So then that means that the number of vertices in my graph, uh, the cardinality of V, is going to be precisely A to the P minus A, because for each vertex we have a corresponding sequence in S and vice versa. Okay, now what I'm going to do is define the edges as, follow, as follows. So suppose U is some vertex in V, and let's say it corresponds to the sequence U1 u2, all the way up to up. Okay, because remember, each vertex in our vertex set corresponds to some sequence in S. So I'm going to say, let u be uh, a vertex which has this corresponding sequence in the set S. Okay, well, let v be any other vertex. Okay, and we'll call it v1, v2, all the way up to vp. Now I'm going to say, uv is a member of the edges of G. In other words, I draw an edge between the vertex u and v, if and only if v is what I want to be, what, what, what I want to call a shift of u by one. So in other words, I shift all the elements in u by one, either to the left or to the right. So v is either u2, u3, all the way up to up, and then u1 wraps around to the end. Okay, so taking u and then shifting each element in u to the left. Okay, so u2 becomes in the first position, U3 comes into the second position, U1 moves to the end position, and so on. Okay, or V shifts, is every element in U shifted to the right. So V is equal to UP, U1, all the way up to UP minus 2, UP minus 1. Okay, so taking U and then shifting every element to the right, and then UP wraps around to the front. 
Okay, so that's how I'm defining uh, whether or not there's an edge between U and V. And now remember, because uh, how we've defined S, there are no constant sequences, so that means that there'll be no self-loops in our graph. So it's going to be a nice, simple graph. Great, now let's use this and move on. Okay, so I've drawn up an example here in the case A equals 2 and P equals 3, and I'll draw on the edges in just a second. Now, I claim that in our arbitrary graph, where A is any natural number is P, and P is any prime, that each vertex has degree 2. Now, this is not too difficult to see, because remember, uh, we're joining two vertices together, if and only if uh, one is a shift of the other by one. So, in other, in other words, one vertex, the corresponding sequence, has every element shifted by one in comparison to the other vertex. And, of course, we can either be shifted uh, one to the left or one to the right, and hence, each vertex has degree 2. Great. And I also claim that each connected component is a cycle of length p. Okay, and I can exemplify that on this graph here. So this is the case a equals 2 and p equals 3. Now look, this vertex here corresponds to this sequence, 1, 2, 1. Now this is of course going to have an edge between these two vertices here, between the one with 2, 1, 1. And that's because this one here is a shift, or if I shift every element here to the left, I get this one here. 1 wraps around to the end, 2 goes to the first element, and this one here becomes a middle element. Great, so there's an edge there. Similarly, there's an edge between these two vertices here, because if I shift, oh no, not those two vertices, <laughs> these two vertices, uh, because if I shift every element here to the left, the two here wraps around to the end, the one here comes to the front, and this one at the end comes to the one in the middle. And similarly, there's an edge here, because I wrap around again once more to the left, giving me this starting sequence. Okay, and similarly, you can see there's a cycle here, like so, I'll let you go through the details there. But notice that we have our connected components are cycles, each of which have length three. One, two, three, one, two, three. Okay, now this is not too, it's not too difficult to convince yourself that that's true in the general case as well. In other words, uh, if we have an arbitrary A natural number and a P a prime number, then uh, our connected components, which remember partition our graph, are gonna be cycles of length P. Okay, so in other words, the number of cycles uh, in our graph, let's call this n, we're going to have the number of cycles in our graph, n, or perhaps I should say number of connected components, okay, and, they all turn, and it turns out that they're all cycles of length n, okay, that's going to be precisely the number of vertices in the graph, which is a to the p minus a. And now because each uh, connected co component has the same number of vertices, namely p, we have that n times p is equal to a to the p minus a. So in other words, n is equal to a to the p minus a over p. Okay, and because n is a natural number, that means this thing is a natural number. And thus we can conclude that p divides a to the p minus a and we've proved Fermat's little theorem. Okay, so that's the proof, it's quite neat. Um, I, we've essentially shown that in one way of counting the vertices, you get the number of cycles times P, okay? And the other way is just looking at the number of vertices, and that's sort of a combinatoric problem, and you get that there are A to the P minus A vertices, and thus just comparing these two things, no noting that N is a natural number, we can conclude that P divides A to the P minus A. Okay, now, before I finish this video, you may be wondering where I use the fact that P was prime in this argument. Because, of course, Fermat's little theorem doesn't hold in general for non-prime P. And to see that, let's just look at this example. Let's say A equals 3 and P equals 4. Well, then A to the P minus A is going to be 3 to the 4 minus 3. 3 to the 4 is 81, minus 3 is 78. And, of course, 4 doesn't divide 78. So that's a counterexample for p not prime. So, so you may be going, well, let's go back to the question, where, where do we use the fact that p was prime? And I sort of skipped over it quite lightly, but it comes in here, noticing that the cycle length is p. Now I claim that if the cycle length is less than p, then p is not prime. Okay, now firstly, let's remember that our, each of these vertices represents a sequence in our set S, and each of the sequences have length p. Now, each sort of edge corresponds to shifting the elements uh, one to the left, say. So if I go around in this cycle here, you can see 
This edge here going from here to here represents shifting the elements to the left. And again, carrying on this cycle, it shifts every element in this sequence to the left, and so on. So if I've got a, a sequence of length P, then shifting across the, the elements all to the left, or, or to the right, doesn't matter, you choose, let's say left, uh, shifting it across one to the left, then again to the left. If I do that P times, I'm going to end up with the same sequence, because of course the sequence is of length P, and if I shift each element across P times, it's just going to end up in the same place. Now, suppose I can do it in fewer than p steps. In other words, there's some sequence in which I can go around, let's say, a times, where a is some number less than p. And no, a must also be bigger than 1, because we have no self-loops in our graph. So suppose there's some a, such that if I take the sequence and shift each element a times to the left, then I end up with the same sequence. Well, now, I know uh, what I'm going to first do is make a as minimum as possible. So suppose a is the smallest uh, integer for which this holds. So, of course, a will be bigger than 1, but if I wrap uh, a around its, uh, if I wrap around my sequence a times, then I get back to the same one, and a is the smallest number which has that property. Okay, well then certainly if I take each integer in my sequence and shift that along two a times, well that's just going to shift it around once a times, and then again a times. So it's going to shift it around once a times to get back to the same starting point, and then shift it around another a times to get me to the same starting point again, so that means that 2a also has the property that uh, when I shift it around um, each element 2a times, I'm going to get back to the same starting point. But in particular, I can generalise that and say that uh, ba, if I shift my uh, sequence along ba times to the left, uh, I'm going to end up with the same sequence where b is any positive integer. But because I know when I shift my, um, my sequence along p times, I'm going to end up at the same Starting point, I can get that B A equals P. Okay, so that was a lot of waffling, and let me just go over what I've done again. So suppose for contradiction, I'm saying there's a cycle in my graph with length A, where A is some number less than P. Well, certainly A must be bigger than 1, because uh, there are no self-loops in my graph. Okay, well, because I'm shifting each element across A times, and I'm getting back to my same sequence, if I shift each element across 2A times, I'm going to get back to my same sequence, 3a times, I'm going to get back to my same, same sequence, and so on. So if I shift it around ba times, where b is some uh, natural number, then I'm also going to end up at the same sequence. Now, because I know when I shift each element p, p times around, because it's a, a, a sequence of length p, then I'm also going to end up at my same starting point. So in other words, I go around this, I start with my sequence of length p, I shift each element once, twice, three times, p times around, then I'm going to end up with the same sequence. So that means that there exists b such that b times a equals p. But, of course, that's a contradiction because a is some number bigger than 1 and less than p. So then that means that p is not prime. Okay, so it's a, a, a kind of a subtlety I jumped over. And I'm not sure if my worded explanation really helped too much in understanding. But hopefully you, you can convince yourself that p must be prime uh, in order to be sure that each cycle is of length p. Okay, and I've sort of used the contrapositive argument. If P wasn't prime, then... Uh, oh, sorry, if there was a cycle of length less than P, then P wouldn't be prime. Okay, anyway, it's a quite a neat proof for Fermat's little theorem. I've gone on a little bit there at the end. Um, but yeah, I, I guess it just does just go to show that separate areas of maths do overlap in the most remarkable of ways. I hope you have enjoyed this proof. If you are new to my channel, please do consider subscribing. I make lots of fun proof videos, problem-solving videos, those sorts of things. Uh, so do be do be sure to to subs oh, do be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any of my future videos. I'm gonna stop talking. Catch you in the next one. Have a great day.